Brassy and Ole on this, <gasps> no, September 13th, 2006. And we have with us today the brothers Collins, Philip and Paul. Been a, been a little while, probably over a year, um, but we've logged a lot of hours with them over uh, that time. Um, before I introduce them, I'm just going to say one thing to them. Guys, no more homework. No more of the literature I have to read is as bad as my literary masterpiece class my freshman year. Um, the stuff that you have with the, was it Michael Corbin's? Uh, oh, yeah, the ACL report. Yeah, yeah, uh, great stuff. So now, uh, yeah, welcome to the Grand Scene All, but before we ever get started, we're going to address one article that's on uh, conspiracyarchive.com that's called Lebanon Victim of the Global Democratic Revolution. Is that correct? That's correct. It's also uh, featured in uh, the ACL report. Which one? I can't remember, but one of the editions also featured this article. All right. Why don't you, so, folks, if you want to look at what we're going to, about which we're going to speak, go to that site, uh, Conspiracy Archive. And, and if they go in from the home page, uh, what do they click on? Resources? Or, or you got a separate link with uh, them? Commentary, I think. Yeah, the commentary. commentary and a link, uh, a list of commentators will come up. And uh, our name will be there, Paul and Philip Collins. And you just click on the Paul and Philip Collins link, and it'll have a list of our articles and also uh, interviews. All right, that's uh, archived audio, I take it, or is that transcripted? It, it. Okay. All right, uh, now, uh, let's go back to the beginning. What's going on with the book? Give us the title. Is it, has it been updated? Is a new edition coming out? Go ahead. Absolutely. The book, uh, The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship, has been updated. It's been expanded and revised. It's now double the size that it was when it was originally released in 2004. It's uh, now uh, over 400-plus pages. And um, it was, it's been uh, released through a book search, and you can find it through book search, www.booksearch.com. It was re it's been, been released in uh, July 2006. So, folks, when you go out to uh, look for it, uh, understand you're not looking for the 2004 edition. You're looking for the 2006 edition, and it has a distinctly different cover. The cover is uh, actually was designed by Terry Melanson, our good friend. And, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, he maintains the uh, Conspiracy Archive uh, webpage and uh, also maintains a webpage for us. That, that's part of that larger webpage. And uh, he did a terrific job. It's, it's got mm -hmm. a, a, a green a green cover, and it's got a picture of the uh, truncated pyramid with the all-seeing eye and uh, a picture of the uh, 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 the digital transformation uh, mural. mural that's uh, at the uh, Colorado... Uh, the, the University of... Yeah. University. The update, what am I saying? Timber. Yeah. So it has a it has a considerably different cover, and uh, uh, that's the that's the one you are you're going to want to look for, and it's at www.booksearch.com. Uh, one, and I know you're not done yet, but let me just interject. I don't know if you get an email from me because I was having problems on the day I wanted to respond to you when you asked me to take a look at that. Did you ever get my reply? No, I sure did it. Well, I'll tell you what. No, that was a real tasteful job. A lot of times, uh, people. Get a little too crazy, but that thing was done extremely, extremely well. So, uh, uh, yeah, good move. And I tell you what, since people often are uh, motivated or induced to buy because of graphics, um, that is not going to hurt you one, one sh way, shape, or form. That was one fine job by Terry. Oh, no, Terry Terry did an absolutely outstanding job. The, the only dilemma was he kept on sending us such good book covers. <laughs> We just had to choose one and everything. I mean, I really wish we could have used them all, but we went with the the one that was, you know, probably summed up the theme of the book the best and everything. But he he just did a terrific job. Now, where else are we? Uh, do we want to talk about um, uh, uh, Corbin's Enterprise, the newsletter sure, he puts sure. out? Currently, we're we're regular columnists now for the ACL Report, which is the official publication of a closer look. Uh, Michael Corbin's. Uh, nationally syndicated radio talk show that broadcast out of uh, Colorado. And uh, you can uh, get the ACL report uh, by going to www4, the number 4, a closer look dot com. And uh, it, you just go there, you find the link to the ACL report. It's right there on the front page. Just click on the link and uh, it'll uh, give you the uh, ordering information for the ACL report. It's an excellent magazine. Uh, we're featured in it every uh, month. So are uh, uh, other uh, reputable authors like uh, William Kennedy, uh, Toby Westerman. It's just a really good source of information. It's uh, no longer available in print. 
it's only available as an EMAG, but it's a terrific uh, magazine. And uh, again, every uh, the uh, article we're going to be covering, covering today, the Lebanon uh, victim of the uh, global democratic revolution article, is also featured in there. Yeah, and I just got somebody mentioning to me uh, what article is it, and that is what it is. It's Lebanon, victim of the global democratic revolution. You go to conspiracyarchive.com, commentary, bang, you'll see it. And uh, you can read along with us uh, as we discuss this. Uh, this this show um, really was um, sparked by a listener who said, you know, what's going on with Lebanon and Iran, and what about predictive programming? We can deal with the predictive programming later. Sure. But, I mean, you kind of lay out a historical background to what's happening today, and it seems that there is, with all that's gone on, and you allude to it, uh, whether it's in your words or the people you quote, that, that really, and this is a crude paraphrase, they run the same scheme time and time again. Now, that's a real general statement, but I'm going to throw it to you guys, Philip Paul. What, what, what about that? Well, that's that's actually that's that's quite true. We do see kind of the same scheme. Global the global democratic revolution is nothing more than the recycling of Trotsky's fourth international of a permanent revolution. What Trotsky and Parvis came up with. Mm -hmm. It's just the same idea being played over and over again. Uh, these the, these neoconservatives really they're nothing more than than the old Trotskyites. They're they're they they're, they were anti-Soviet. They weren't anti-communist and all, but they. Were, but because of their anti-Soviet inclinations, they were able to piggyback on the anti-communist movement uh, and, and play off of the native fears of, America, of Americans uh, of an of a, uh, expanding Soviet imperium and were able to just uh, build a, a rather extensive network and finally get that network uh, really, really entrenched into the American political landscape, and yeah, it's just it's all it is is it's is it's the same plans that 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 Trotsky had uh, had devised, that Parvis had devised, mm -hmm. and uh, what the, what these neoconservatives essentially are is that it is they are Trotskyites that have taken some Leo Straussian fascist additives and some technocratic ideas and blended it. With with their t uh, Trotskyite beliefs into what can be described as a new Jacobinism or Jacobinism. Uh, <clears throat> the Jacobins, you will recall, were the Illuminist revolutionaries, the most violent faction of the of the revolutionaries in France that helped bring about the French Revolution, and they they dethroned their uh, their opponents, the Girondins, who wanted to keep uh, a monarch on the throne in France. Who who many were many Girondins were duped into believing that the French Revolution was supposed to be nothing more than the ideological kissing cousin of the American Revolution. They were able to kick them out. They were able to form what was called the Jacobin uh, dictatorship uh, and had a small group of 12 men called the uh, Committee of Public Safety running the whole country. And uh, basically it, it was it was an early version of, of, the sci of a scientific dictatorship right there. That's what we have now. We got we, we, we have neo Jacobins with these uh, with these neo conservatives. They're they're uh, they 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 can claim the French Revolution as their heritage and as their tradition as opposed to the American uh, Revolution as their tradition. And uh, <clears throat> when we look at Lebanon, the question comes up: Who's to blame for that uh, that 34 day? war that we had there that was absolutely terrible. And you got one side such as uh, John Hagee and a lot of these pro-Israel kind of uh, ministries saying that it was all the uh, the fault of the Arabs and, and basically they have a belief of ethnic salvation that the Jews are right by virtue of their ethnic of their ethnicity and that the and that they they are saved and chosen people of God by virtue of what race they belong to which is 
which is, of course, wrong. Then we have the other side, uh, which is equally wrong, that, can, that is basically summed up by uh, groups such as American Free Press. People will remember that they used to be Liberty Lobby or uh, Victor Thorne, his uh, Wing TV uh, organization, that, that say that it's all Zion, brutal Zionist mm-hmm. occupation and that it's all the, it's the, it's the Israelites and, uh, and they, they basically characterize groups like Hezbollah as resistance fighters and not as terrorists, but they're not resistance fighters at all. They're, they're terrorists, and they were hiding behind the people of Lebanon. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, is that both of those sides are, are fundamentally wrong. And all. If you want to point the accusatory finger at anybody, you have to point it at these neo-Jacobins. When, uh, back in 2002, I was contacted by uh, an Israeli investigative reporter by the name of Joel Bainerman. He had seen an article of mine in Nexus magazine, and we struck up a correspondence as a result of that. And during the course of that correspondence, I got fairly acquainted with his writings. And he pointed out in his writings that what what was behind this long, drawn-out conflict between Arabs and Jews in the Middle East was not was not the Arabs or the Jews, but what he called FEs. And FEs are simply, uh, it's a, simply a term for foreign elites. And it, it, what, what you, when you look at Lebanon, you see that, uh, and what happened over there with the, with, the, with the conflict that we just went through over there, you see that, that's, that he was correct in that assertion that foreign elites are behind the conflict. Uh, what, 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 what was going on was the was the uh, the neo Jacobins, the neo conservatives, were spreading their doctrine of a global democratic revolution in the region using the uh, the um, assassination last year of Rafiq Harari, who was the former uh, prime minister of Lebanon, as the as the catalyst. Uh, when Rafiq Harari was killed, you'll remember that this administration blamed Syria for the for the assassination, and they began to to uh, send out these little threatening warning signs that there needed to, like saying that there needed to be a regime change in Damascus, and and all these different things in, to to intimidate Syria and to basically get Syria out of the area, out of out of uh, out of Lebanon, and the truth is, is that Syria was probably needed in that region because of the fighting that goes on between the Druze and the and the Christians and and the air and the the different Muslim groups. They were pretty much keeping and policing the the, mm-hmm. the region, but but uh, Syria did comply and removed themselves from the situation, and then the administration began to push for a, a uh, for for um, uh, elections and for the democratic process to be put into play in this area. Now, the kind of democracy that they press for is what is known as plebiscitary democracy. And plebiscitary democracy is different than the, dem- the democracy that we find in our Republican system. It's, it's, it's a democracy that is totally free of the rule of law. And and it's it's just where the it's majoritarian. The majority rules and gets what they want, even if their uh, decision came as a result of the influence of a demagogue. Uh, some uh, or you know if it was based on rash emotionalism, on impulse. Yes, and if I may cut in here, um, um, it's also known as pure democracy. And pure democracy, uh, to understand what a pure democracy is as opposed to representative democracy, which is what you have in uh, the case of a constitutional republic, uh, pure democracy, to, uh, to know what it means, you just have to etymologically pick apart the word democracy. It comes from the 
Greek words, demos kratia, which means the people to rule. And so whatever the people rule, uh, based on impulses, appetites, emotions, um, that is what becomes the rule. It has uh, nothing to do with the rule of law. And uh, the reason, one of the reasons that uh, the neoconservatives, uh, as part of their, uh, are pushing uh, pure democracy or uh, plebiscitary democracy and pushed it in that region is it's all part of their neo-Trotskyist uh, heritage. Uh, it, it harkens back to uh, the old uh, communist doctrines. Uh, for instance, V.I. Lenin said that uh, democracy is indispensable to socialism. Uh, Karl Marx in the mm-hmm. Communist Manifesto said that the war of the uh, the war of the uh, proletariat was a war uh, 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 was a war for democracy, and so this harkens back to their neo Trotskyist heritage. It also harkens back to their Jacobin heritage. The Jacobins uh, in uh, revolutionary France also pushed for a uh, pure democracy, a majoritarian, uh, plebiscitary democracy. Mm-hmm. But as uh, uh, if anybody who does their homework, as they will find, uh, the good majority of the uh, uh, founding fathers were against such uh, democracies. Uh, Madison uh, said that democracies had always been spectacles of turbulence and contention. Uh, Samuel Adams warned that democracies never last, that they always uh, uh, end in uh, waste and uh, murders, and uh, uh, the democracies themselves commit suicide. They are self-immolating uh, suicide pacts. But uh, at any rate, that was the uh, sort of democracy that the uh, neoconservatives were installing in the uh, Middle East. That's what the uh, global democratic revolution is att- attempting to install. Well, and, oh, sorry. Well, no, let me just go back for a second. You covered a lot of ground. Sure. Um, I had said at the outset that it's the same scheme. Now, uh, looking back at, w- at who or what orchestrates all this throughout the centuries, um, you, you and I know, and those who believe on the Bible, that it is the, the, uh, the prince of darkness. For those who want to deal in an occult sense, in a secular sense, we could call it the Illuminati or New World Order. Mm-hmm. Going back, as far as you want to, I mean, even if you pick up on the Jacobins, I mean, aren't we also looking at the extension of, of the Illuminati religion, which is really masonry? Absolutely. And can we assume also that the Jacobins might have been at work in the United States also, even as if it was a, uh, shall we say, a preliminary? Well, what happened was that when the French Revolution took off, um, the, the, the Illuminists were very, very crafty individuals. And going all the way back to the Illuminist founder, Adam Weishaupt, uh, they had this thing where they would basically play off their principles as ideological kissing cousins to the American Revolution. Uh, mm-hmm. Weishaupt wanted people to believe that, that the principles that he was putting forward were on par with the American Revolution. And a lot of people got duped as a result. Sure. Jefferson, for the longest time, defended Adam Weishaupt and was a strong supporter of, of Illuminism, believing that it was on par with what the American experiment was all about. And uh, so when, for, when the French Revolution took off, there was a lot of people that w- here in the United States that welcomed it with open arms. And uh, um, the uh, revolutionary government sent over an ambassador named Edmund Genet. And Edmund Genet ended up using his place as an ambassador here in the United States to whip up all sorts of Illuminist intrigue. He started what were known as democratic societies, which were nothing more than the uh, Jacobins really being installed here and uh, well imported into this country. Uh, And uh, they were just even Washington recognized this. They were where they were perfectly in uh, just a model of the same thing as the as the Jacobins were. And he tried to also use this country as a launching point for foreign wars against other countries. And uh, eventually, and eventually, uh, Genet, when the, when the revolution began to break down over in France, he had to beg uh, Washington to stay here because he knew if he went back, he'd lose his head. And uh, he he just continued with those with those uh, intrigues, and uh, that led to uh, Illuminism 
being imported into this into this country, uh, going all the way back to to Genet and and the in the in the French Revolution. They, a lot of those democratic societies went went underground, and uh, and you really in this era, which. Uh, which could be almost referred to as the revelation of the method era. Uh, that's what some researchers refer to it as, where where the, the, they no longer feel a need to hide and they can just, you know, pull back the curtain and show their plans. You, you can see where Illuminism is is everywhere. And it probably mm-hmm. came here is at that at that point in time. Yeah, and uh, to give another example of how this... Uh, how, how this continuum of the uh, Illuminist uh, tradition, uh, uh, how far back it, it stretches and how uh, pervasive it is, uh, it w- became very much evident during uh, the uh, uh, FDR period of history, during the New Deal uh, mm-hmm. period of history. Uh, of course, the neoconservatives were uh, very much supportive, uh, supportive of uh, FDR's administration, and so was the technocratic movement, mm-hmm. which uh, seems to be closely uh, akin to uh, the neoconservative movement. But as Irving Crystal points out in his book, uh, uh, The Autobiography of an Idea, uh, Neoconservatism, The Autobiogra- Autobiography of an Idea, the neoconservatives agreed with uh, FDR in principle. Mm-hmm. Well, FDR was a uh, 32nd degree uh, Freemason, and uh, he also had in his administration a man by the name of uh, Henry Wallace, who was also a 32nd degree Freemason, and uh, it was under his administration that a uh, icon of esoteric significance to uh, Freemasonry, and that actually dates back uh, it, far, far beyond mm-hmm. Freemasonry, even to the old Italian uh, humanist of the uh, Renaissance. Uh, uh, this icon was placed on the uh, one dollar bill, right. and that, of That's course, right. has come to be be known as the uh, Great Seal. Mm-hmm. And it was placed on the uh, one dollar bill by the Secretary of Treasury Henry Morgenthau Jr., who was also a Freemason. But the uh, one, uh, the Great Seal, which of course is the uh, truncated pyramid uh, mounted by the all-seeing eye, uh, that that was a uh, symbol of esoteric significance to the. Uh, Bavarian Illuminati was a symbol of esoteric significance mm-hmm. to Freemasonry and also uh, a, a symbol of esoteric significance to the Italian humanist who would uh, have, uh, co-opt operative Freemasonry and uh, transform it into speculative Freemasonry. And uh, it, it basically represents it, it basically represents what they are attempting to install, which is a novos ordu seculorum. Mm-hmm. And that, that's right. a part of the great seal. It means uh, a new secular order or a new order of the ages and uh, that that basically uh, harkens back to an older tradition of which neoconservatism is a part well let's look again from the time that you've mentioned now with the Jacobins and uh, the new uh, uh, Jack, uh, Jacobinism and see how it applies today uh, if, if we remember also that uh, after the French Revolution we have Napoleonic Wars and I would say you would agree that this was a move on empire uh, yeah. Do I think France is going to rule the world? No. They were you being used as the muscle. Let's fast forward a couple of centuries. Now, we're being used as the muscle and have been in the 20th century right now. Let's go as it takes the Middle East. We know that's been a hotbed of activity for most of the conflicts in the last, shall we say, 30 years. Mm-hmm. But what, what strikes me so much is the fact that in the Jacobin, uh, Jacobin head, rather, in the Illuminati head, in the order out of chaos head, you create or support the Muhadin when you need them, Al-Qaeda when you need them, and Hezbollah when you need them. And as you quote or, or in show in your article, especially all the provocateuring that Brzezinski was doing. That's right. To, to make sure we had, right, to make sure we had this pile of craziness that's going on in the Middle East. And so, uh, again, you're using the same tactics, and I'm glad that you mentioned uh, that this was basically, and it's Hegelian, we know that. You, you create the problem, you provide the solution. Do you want to touch upon some of the intrigues that were going on uh, right around the end of the 70s into the 80s, which we are seeing actually the harvest of now? 
that that's probably very important that we do that. First of all, let me just say that when you bring up order of uh, chaos, that principle, mm -hmm. order out of chaos, we do find it in neoconservatism. Yes, we do. People need to uh, pick up some of Michael Ledeen's writings. Michael Ledeen is an arch neoconservative. Uh, it, it, he he has written this book. Uh, I believe that the name of the book is Race Against the Terror Masters, or there's something like that. Uh, probably slaughtering the name of the book. But <laughs> in that book, uh, Michael Ledeen lays out a neoconservative doctrine known as crea uh, creative destruction. Creative destruction is nothing more than the ordo ab chaos, if you look at it and all. It's the, it's the tearing down of the old order and the installation of a new order, it, both, both abroad and here in the United States, according to him in his book. So it's nothing more than, than the recycling of the whole uh, uh, principle of mm -hmm. order out of chaos. Before we go any further, and I'm throwing it right back to you, so hold on to your thought, but boy, you just made a bell go off. Not too long ago, we talked about Edward Bernays, who was the first public relations guy. and okay, very yeah, propaganda. Well, in his book, and I went and I, I had it in my hands, I, I don't own it, but right then he says, you know, we're going to make order out of chaos, like it's so in your face. Yeah. You know, and this goes back to the 20s. He, of course, he was part of the, he knew the handshake, he knew the plan. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, they go ahead and they go right out and say it to you, and it's like, well, here we go. Yeah, and if you look at Michael Ledeen's actions, you can see where he has, throughout his career, uh, been trying to, to do this, trying to precipitate uh, chaos so that, you know, his own version of order can be, can be installed. Mm -hmm. For instance, <clears throat> there's an individual named Manukar Gorbanifar. And anybody that has studied Iran Contra knows about this guy. Along with uh, Adnan Khashoggi, he was kind of one of these arms middlemen mm -hmm. between Ali North and, and the and the uh, the arms dealers. Um, uh, he, he he played a major role in Iran Contra. Well, Gorbanifar came forward and claimed that he had information about Iran's nuclear program and, and that they were in possession of, of weapons of mass destruction. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Michael Ledeen has been the foremost sponsor of Gorbanifar. And Michael Ledeen has, has, had just been trying off the hook going back about maybe two and a half years now uh, before Iran really hit the spotlight the way it has now. He was just determined to get the United States government to listen to Garbanifar, even though Garbanifar had a, a lie detector test administered to him twice by the Central Ad, uh, Intelligence Agency, and he failed them. And he was just determined to get the administration to listen to Garbanifar and, and deter... And, persuade the United States government basically to go off to war with Iran. So you can see where he is put, play, putting the whole order out of chaos mm -hmm. uh, principle into practice just under a different name, creative destruction. Trying to tear down the old order there in that region of the world and install his own. Uh, which is basically the, the neoconservative conception which which bears resemblance to all the other elite factions' uh, idea of uh, the concept of a, of a new world order. Yes. You're listening, you're listening to the grass, you know. We have with us Paul and Philip Collins. Uh, we're talking about uh, this one particular article that you can access on cons uh, conspiracyarchive.com, and that's Lebanon, a uh, victim of the global democratic revolution, and we're kind of defining what that is and what it has been through the century. So get it, pick it on up. Okay. Well... <clears throat> As I said, when uh, when Syria was pushed out of out of um, Lebanon, this administration began to press for what is no for for d democratic elections over in that area for plebiscitary democracy in Lebanon. It was it was the global democratic revolution being manifested over there as what Paula uh, Dobriansky called the Cedar Revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Cedar Revolution, and the Orange Revolution, the Olive Leaf Revolution, all these different revolutions that the administration has been declaring all over the world, and all, they're, they're nothing more than, than manifestations of the global democratic revolution. And the truth is, is that uh, this, this region of the world was not ready for democracy. Uh, 
going back, going back into the, where where the 70s and the 80s overlapped, there had been the social engineering project where the people were brainwashed into a radical form of Islam that had been dormant for the most part, and had and, and was now being awakening awakened by uh, by different factions of, of Western elites and the intelligence community. And uh, as you pointed out earlier, uh, the national security advisor to Carter, Brzezinski, had played a tremendous role in this project. Yeah. Um, so did uh, the director of CIA, Robert Gates, uh, before Stanfield Turner came in under, uh, under uh, uh, Carter. Um, what, what they did was the uh, American intelligence services began to funnel aid to the Mujahideen mm -hmm. uh, six months before the Soviet uh, um, intervention. And what they were trying to do by doing this was entice the Soviet army to invade. We didn't know this prior. This history has just recently came out. We, we always thought that the funneling of, of support to the Mujahideen began after the Soviet uh, invasion. It didn't. We, we, we were sending uh, the, the Mujahideen uh, their support prior to the Soviet invasion, and what we were trying to do was entice them to invade uh, over, over there um, in uh, Afghanistan. Let me just add this uh, little historical note, because this is what you brought flooding back to me. Uh, you're absolutely right about what you stated and how uh, there was preparation for the Mujahideen. And I'll tell you what happened. Uh, a few days before Christmas 1979, I was leaving Vermont, <clears throat> going to Iowa, stopped in to see a friend of mine in New Jersey. He gets the annual Christmas phone call from his brother-in-law, and I can hear him on his end of the line. You know, it was sounding really provocative. So he hangs up the phone, and I go, what's up? He says, well, my brother-in-law works in the military terminal in Bayonne. And he said, he doesn't understand what's going on. He said, but they just shipped out the most munitions they had ever shipped since Vietnam. And we're like, well, where are they going? He goes, I don't know. He says, it's like someplace in the Middle East. Yeah. So here you go. I mean, that stuff was up and off and running. And the reason that they got it going so quickly is because it's not because they began the work in 1980. The truth is is that on July 3rd, 1979, President Carter had signed that first directive for the uh, aid to the, uh, to the Afghan uh, uh, freedom fighters over there. That's when it began. And, uh, and that's why they, they, it was off and running as fast as, as, it, as it was, uh, because the preparations and the, and, the, and the planning and all of that was already well underway. And, you know, uh, but that Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, it provided a, a pretext for Brzezinski uh, to, to begin this uh, radicalization process over there. Well, let me ask you this before we go any further, and this is a, a straight-out question. You know where I'm going to be by the way I ask it. But I would say, knowing the way things always go, that this was all part of the plan. That's right. Brzezinski does his role. The United States does its role. The Soviets play their role. I mean, everybody's making money. Uh, and then you, and that creates a further destabilization. So it wasn't like the Soviets, I don't think, had to be suckered in or enticed. It's like it's always part of the plan. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that, I, I see, like, like we've pointed out before, uh, I, I think that, that the, the conspiracy is non-monolithic and that uh, there is some actual legitimate sparring going on. And uh, I, I think that, that, they, that, that the Soviet Union uh, was not necessarily in on the plan, so to speak, because they are a, they are a creation of the power structure. Uh, but that, uh, but that, that this is an, uh, an example of them being managed. Yeah. Well, if you look at the fact that the neoconservatives were, were basically anti-Soviets, um, um, and that's not... The yeah, supposedly, as, right, right. Yeah, they, they, that's not the same as anti-communists, because what, they, what they're pushing for mm -hmm. here is their own variety of uh, communism, their own variety of uh, socialism, which is trying mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. nature. Uh, it, it was basically, if you look at it, it was a case of the uh, neoconservatives really, uh, uh, really uh, kind of uh, suckering their uh, Soviet counterparts um, and, and really playing this, this uh, really dangerous 
dangerous, really unstable chess game with uh, with their Soviet counterparts. But because by enticing uh, the, their Soviet counterparts into the uh, Afghanistan debacle, uh, that in part contributed to uh, largely bankrupting the uh, Russian economy. Uh, now, of course, uh, as uh, theoreticians and uh, uh, historians like uh, Galitsyn have pointed out, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union was cosmetic at best, and we're seeing that now since uh, Russia right. is beginning to uh, resurrect itself. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not re resurrecting itself under the label of Soviet, but it's certainly the old Soviet uh, imperium uh, come to haunt us again, especially with uh, President Vladimir Putin, who was former KGB and very much a, a hardliner communist, and that his stripe and pedigree as a hardline communist and as an old school uh, Soviet is becoming evident uh, right now with uh, the hard uh, crackdowns that he's uh, bringing down upon uh, the uh, the native uh, the native populations of Russia and and how he's coming to, uh, head to head with uh, the West now and ha how basically he's beginning to butt heads with uh, America. Well, did you? Did, let me ask you something. Did you recall a speech that was given by a Soviet slash Russian um, dissident uh, in Belgium a while ago? Byakov, or you know, I just I, the names. In which he stated that the trilaterals went over there, guess who, Rockefeller, right? and basically told Gorbachev, guess what, Gorby, you know, you're going to downsize, this is the end of the Soviet Union, and this is the next step. And what's interesting, too, guys, is that Rockefeller was in Russia right after the revolution, using the American Red Cross and, and certain uh, extensions of them, Raymond Robin, who led, the, who led the contingent, which was anything but humanitarian. In other words, these capitalists, and this is no surprise to you, but let the people hear it, were involved with the overthrow of the czars, were involved with propping up the Bolsheviks, and, you know, continue even to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing before we go any further, and again, I'm throwing it back to you. I just want to get this out because so much stuff goes by. Um, two other characters that are very interesting in at least getting the Cold War up and running, whereas now we're, we were looking in the, in the years 1980s as kind of the end of the Cold War, but stoking this thing up, either well-intentioned or not. Two characters I want to ask you if you've heard of, James Burnham and George Kennan. Uh, Burnham is actually uh, a neoconservative. There you go. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And people should read his writings, which sounds like he's anti-communist, like you all said. But in essence, he's actually creating a boogeyman that's going to start this whole, you know, yin and yang between West and East. That's right. So, good, excellent. And I tell you people, if it's still up on the, on the website, do a search on James Burnham. I think you can also use the word, what, managerial or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I think you'll pop up the writings. There's like three of them, and really extensive, that I think came out of the University of North Carolina website. If it's yeah. not, do you know if it's still there? Uh, I'm not too sure. I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, uh, it's worth looking into. All right, let me just say this, and I'm, like I said, I'm kicking it back to you. If anybody wants to read those writings and can't find them, I, have, I am pretty sure, I'm not going to call them up now, but I saved them and word docs, and I would, I would gladly disseminate them so you can find an early mindset. We're looking at a post-1945 mindset for what was to come, and take it away. Okay. Um, let me just say, um, uh, uh, um, with, with you, Viz, you, you seem to come from the Cleon Skousen school as far as what went on with, ca uh, with, uh, with, uh, with communism. You're, you're, uh, you're familiar with, with Cleon Skousen, uh, the both he and ca capitalist? Yeah, both, and, and what was that? His nephew, Joel, too, kind of. Yeah. yeah, well, well, Phil and I are more of like, or, or more uh, on the line with his nephew Joel, uh, Joel Skousen. But Cleon's uh, uh, contention was was that that ca uh, communism was tightly controlled in every single aspect, and it went exactly the way that the capitalists, that the Western elites wanted it to go every time, all the time. Joel is a little bit different in, he, in, in the respect that he says, well, they facilitated the rise of communism, but the power organism gains a degree of sovereignty uh, from the power structure, and you, don't, you can't always control the direction that it's going to go, and it didn't always necessarily go in the direction that the uh, Western elites and the capitalists uh, wanted it to go. And there was times where they would actually get quite naughty and get out of line, and even though you cracked the whip a little bit, you didn't necessarily get the desired results. I, I tell you what, uh, in general, 
although it is a generality, I would agree with your assessment of where I'm coming from. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, before Cleon Skousen passed away, him and uh, Joel Skousen had what Joel Skousen called a meeting of the minds, where where Cleon Skousen basically came to uh, agree with uh, agree with uh, Joel's assessment of the whole thing and all. But uh, anyways, long way around the barn, that, that when that Soviet invasion did take place, uh, <clears throat> Brzezinski and his uh, cabal basically used the invasion as a pretext for radicalizing Afghan children over there. And the children were propagandized uh, by, by these, by these uh, under the pretext of education, by these textbooks that were filled with very violent images and uh, militant Islamic teachings uh, that, that were sent over there. And uh, if I recall correctly, the books were developed in the 1980s under the Agency of the, for International Development. Uh, they, they gave a grant to the University of Nebraska Omaha and its Center for uh, Afghanistan Studies. And uh, the agency spent about $51 million on the university's education programs in Afghanistan from about, uh, I'd say, 84 to 94. And these books were circulated far and wide amongst the Afghan the, the children and basically uh, radicalized them and, and led to this radical form of Islam uh, uh, that we see uh, today because it, it didn't just stay in Afghanistan. No. Um, with with the, the, both the CIA and the Pac in Pakistan's ISI, which is basically a CIA surrogate, uh, they they uh, uh, started a program where uh, 35,000 Muslim uh, Muslims uh, from 40 Islamic countries uh, came over to Afghanistan and joined the fight, and uh, many of them went to study in Pakistani madrasas, and basically Afghanistan was used as the staging ground, this launching ground for this violent new form of Islam, and it was it, it was spread from Afghanistan into the Middle East and into all the countries, and a form of it had found and taken root in Lebanon, and and uh, the the people were brainwashed over there into this this uh, violent form of of um, Islam. Islam. Mm -hmm. And, and and so and so they were totally unprepared for for elections because what are they going to vote for? They're going to vote for anybody that that voices that that radical view, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, Hezbollah won the largest number of representative uh, representatives in its history when the elections occurred over there, and then uh, I believe in July of 2005, Hezbollah was actually asked to join the, Leb the, the Lebanese government. And this, of course, may... It, it, now, uh, if, if the rule of law had been involved in the whole process, if this was not plebiscitary democracy, if this was uh, Republican in nature, like, uh, like what the Founding Fathers had in mind, then what would have happened first is that radicals and, and, and the fanatics would have been filtered out of the system and Hezbollah would have been disarmed and all. But that didn't happen. No. And, and the people were just, were, were, were given elections and the, and we just basically saw Hezbollah come to a, to a place of power over there that they had not enjoyed prior to this, mm -hmm. to this period of time. Yeah. And that was all facilitated by the rise of the uh, neo-Jacobin, uh, neo-Trotskyist variety of democracy that was uh, promoted by the uh, neoconservatives here in the West. It was basically provided a catalyst for the rise of uh, radicalism mm -hmm. in Lebanon, which in turn would then again give us a, 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 a pretty much intentionally uh, man manufactured uh, blowback uh, that is uh, uh, basically a, an intentionally manufactured uh, enemy, an adversary, and uh, lead to uh, yet another controlled conflict over in the Middle East, which again has been serving the uh, purposes and aims and goals of the neoconservatives rather well. I want to talk about those aims and goals and where you think or know this is going, but you know, if you ever thought Orwell 
was nuts for saying things that seem like a contradiction in terms of oxymorons, like war is peace. All you have to look at are the Trotskyites, as they said, the neoconservatives who are so far right, they're left. Because what, what was their goal? It's endless war for endless peace. That's, that's correct. Uh, go ahead. If you want to know really where this conflict is going, and uh, uh, um, you, you have to go out. The audience needs to go out and they need to pick up a copy of Wesley Clark's book, Winning Modern Wars. In that book, he uh, shares an experience that he had with early in 2003 prior to the invasion of Iraq when he went to the Pentagon. He went to the Pentagon, he spoke to a, a Pentagon staff member there and asked, is, is the invasion a go? And the staff member said, yes, the invasion is a go, but this is just the beginning of a five-year campaign that will involve attacks, not just on invasions of not only Iraq, but Iran, of Somalia, of Lebanon, of Libya, and it just ran down the list of the nations uh, that, that, that the administration intended to move against. Right, and they became the axis of evil um, on that hit list. That's right. right. That's right. Well, the, 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 needless to say, with the way that Iraq has been going, that that campaign had been losing steam. And, and by, by having what we have now over in Lebanon, which is a very, very, uh, very sensitive uh, kind of situation right now, you now have... The, the, the kind of situation where that, that campaign can get started again because you now have an enemy installed over there that, you, that will provide the pretext for an, an invasion. Uh, Hezbollah, let's just face it, Hezbollah has to be taken out one way or another, and I'm going to make a prediction right now. They're talking about a UN coalition going over there. And, and taking care of the situation, forget it. A UN coalition will not be able to solve the issue over there. Why? The Lebanese government has to approve any UN presence in their in their country. And who's part of the Lebanese government? Hezbollah. So is Hezbollah going to allow a competitive military force? that has the ability to disarm them into Lebanon, you're nuts if you think they would. No. So what's going to go over there is going to be a completely impotent uh, joke of a force, and when things start to break out again, they won't be able to manage it, so American forces will have to go in eventually. Or Israeli, it's, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now let me ask you this. Um, along the way of predictive programming, just as you saw it, and, and what this, uh, <clears throat> the further game that this might uh, have with Lebanon. You know, in, in a couple of days, literally, I heard how um, Lebanon might have been using uh, Iran Iranian-made missiles, and then like, you know, three days, bang, oh, no, Lebanon is a proxy of Iran. It's Iran, Iran, Iran. Now, is there, is there some mileage about this um, involvement with Lebanon that allows connectivity and justification for some kind of conflagration with Iran? Yes, yes, there is. Uh, and not just Iran. They were hoping to connect it all to Syria, too. <clears throat> Syria has been a favorite pincushion of this administration ever since things began to go south with Iraq. Um, if, you'll, uh, if you'll notice, whenever something bad happened in Iraq, this president would blame it on foreign insurgents sent over to Iraq from Syria. And, uh, and this is his way of, of basically taking the blame off of himself and, and, and off of the way that he and his administration has managed Iraq. Uh, uh, the truth is, is that in all likelihood, uh, much of the insurgency that we see over there is being carried out by Iraqis, but the American public are not supposed to hear that at all because if it were to be known that, that it was actual Iraqis that did not want us over mm -hmm. there, then the screams to get out would get louder. And, all. and it was really funny. Do you remember when, when the president made that vulgar statement at the G8 conference? Uh, which one would that be? Uh, the, the one to uh, Tony Blair. 
Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the microphones pick, picked them up. Well, well, everybody got caught on the fact that he had used a, uh, a vulgarity in, in his statement. And all. What was funny to me was he was, uh, in, on one hand, he says to Syria, get out of Lebanon. And then all of a sudden he turns around, and in this statement to Tony Blair, he says, well, Syria's got to take care of this, has got to get the leash around Hezbollah, and needs to start taking care of this. So, I mean, on one hand, he says, Syria, we don't want you involved, get out. And then he says, well, Syria, you need to be taking care of this problem with Hezbollah. So which is it? Do you want them involved, or do you want them not involved? And again, this this whole Cedar Revolution that happened over there with the installation of plebiscitary democracy uh, goes back to the uh, kill, uh, to the assassination of Rafiq Harari, which was blamed on Syria. But if you look at that whole uh, investigative report by the UN into who killed uh, <clears throat> into who killed Rafiq Harari, you'll, you'll find out that uh, one of the report's witnesses actually bragged to the German magazine Der Spiegel that uh, his Harari testimony had made him a millionaire, and another witness uh, actually recanted his testimony against uh, uh, Syria uh, and let it be known that he had been tortured and then offered $1.3 million by Lebanese officials to lie about Syria and Syria's involvement. So the whole thing was a, was a, was a joke to put everything off on... Uh, off on uh, Syria, you know, and and like you're saying, there there, there is a connection to try to get uh, get Iran involved in this in this too, uh, which I think might actually be legitimate because if you'll notice the whole war, the whole war did break out on the week of the G8 summit and. Uh, it's kind of funny that it worked that way. It did play to Iran's advantage because what would have been the primary talk at the G8? Right. Well, what would have been Iran's nuclear program? Let me that get this. didn't happen and all, as, as a result of the war breaking out in Lebanon. Lebanon came onto the table, and uh, Iran was and its weapons program was kind of swept to the side. So it did play to their advantage and everything. But, but uh, yeah, I, I can see, though, where it's kind of being used as a pretext to move against Iran, uh, whether legitimate or not. Let me throw this out to you in the time we got left. This is the last big question we're going to have time for, uh, and I'm throwing it at both of you. All right, now, you've documented uh, Brzezinski's instigation uh, and provocateuring in Mideast conflicts back in the late 70s and the 80s. He's also the guy that pens the grand chessboard in which right. he warns that we shouldn't mess with Iran. Now, what do you think about this, and don't you find it interesting that he's looking at this with, like, you know, with a dipped eyebrow, so concerned about us, you know, possibly going into Iran and then getting China and Russia involved, after he was the one who was the architect of, of a lot of this chaos. So, in other words, can we look at a scripted uh, involvement with Iran that may lead in four or five years to a Eurasian uh, blow-up. That's what I think. That's what I believe is, go is going to happen. I think that it's going to pull China and Russia also into it, and it's going to become a global, uh, a global war. It's going to become a third hot war. Uh, you mm -hmm. Remember, we had the First World War, the Second World War. Some people consider uh, cold, uh, the Cold War, World War Three. I, I personally don't consider it that because it was a Cold War. It has to be a hot war. Uh, this, mm -hmm. this would, this would be that Third World War. And the funny thing is, is that if you look back throughout history at the different Illuminist groups and the different elitist cabals, they've always kicked around the idea of, of, of a third global war as a way of, of jump-starting this planet into, into a uh, new world order. Mm -hmm. uh, going all the way back to a letter that was written from Pike to Mazzini, uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, mm -hmm. Uh, and Albert Pike, where Albert Pike laid out the groundwork for three big global wars, and at the end of the third global war, uh, basically the monotheist and the atheist were going to be wiped out, and the uh, Luciferian religion was going to be installed. Now, some people question whether or not those letters really exist at, uh, at all, but there is a body of evidence to suggest that they did, because uh, the, those statements and, and what he had written in those letters were circulating in books uh, well, well, 
that, that came out well before the First and Second World mm -hmm. War. So, I mean, I, I believe that, the, that they really were truly his statements mm -hmm. and that those letters did, in fact, exist. Yeah, that original was supposed to be, and I think William Still said he either saw it or he validated, which is still somebody saying something about something, that that original uh, letter was at one time and no longer uh, on display in the uh, London Museum. Now, yeah, we're yeah. running out of time. It the British Museum, and then it just yeah. disappeared. Funny, funny that happened. Yeah. Um, we have a little time left, so let's get down to one. Uh, the book where people can purchase it, uh, where your other writings are, and all that you got shaken. Sure. Well, uh, the new edition, the new edition of folks, that's uh, a 2006 edition, not the 2004. 2006 edition of the Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship can be purchased at uh, www.booksearch.com. Just go to Book Search, enter the title or our names into the search engine, and it'll pop it up there. And uh, also you can uh, read uh, a lot of our work uh, in the ACL report. That's the official publication of A Closer Look, which is uh, Michael Corbin's nationally syndicated radio talk show program that broadcasts out of Colorado. You can find out how to get that magazine by going to www.4theNumber4aclosolook.com. And uh, finally, you can read a, a large uh, collection of our writings and also download uh, interviews with us at Terry Melanson's excellent Conspiracy Archive uh, website. By the way, he also did the book cover, um, and that's uh, www.conspiracyarchive.com forward slash commentary with a capital C forward slash Collins with a capital C dot PHP. Make sure you get those capital C's or you'll probably wind up in no man's land on the internet going to some place where they're offering to enhance <laughs> size or something. So, yeah. <laughs> um, also, we're going to uh, pick this up next Wednesday, and I, I've not been repleted all with uh, about the topics we might speak to, uh, mainly to see how today went. And so uh, when you pass it along to me, uh, I will put that up on the site so we can give a little bit more clarity. But you will be on uh, next Wednesday. Uh, hopefully we'll see you perhaps in early October, uh, and we'll continue this. Uh, uh, it's great stuff, and I, you know, I thank you guys for coming on. And always look forward to it, and uh, I won't be the same for another uh, two days. So. <laughs> well, thank you for having us. All right, listen, God bless you both. We'll see you soon.